Hey everybody, what's up? It's your buddy Chase. Welcome to another episode of the show. This is the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live, the show where I sit down with amazing humans and unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams. And today's insanely badass guest is Mr. Malcolm Gladwell. Of course, you know his work, things like Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers. He is an award-winning author, multiple New York Times bestsellers. He's also into some new stuff audio. He has got an incredible podcast called Revisionist History, among a couple of others, and he's the president of Pushkin Industries, uh, where they're exploring all kinds of audio uh, art. And today's episode with Mr. Malcolm Gladwell features one of those pieces, uh, a new work that he has collaborated with the one and only Mr. Paul Simon. Incredible piece, and it's called Miracle and Wonder. We go deep on all sorts of things, his creative process, the creative process behind the legendary songwriter, Paul Simon. We talk about the ability to choose what you want to be and become in this world, how Paul Simon did it, how Malcolm Gladwell did it, and how you can do it, Um, how to know what to pursue, where your areas of genius may lie. It may be in your background. It may be the fact that you have not yet tasted enough things in the world. It is a fascinating episode. I've wanted to have Malcolm on the show for a really, really long time, and this couldn't be a better time to interact and intersect with his career arc in this new work of genius. Again, Miracle and Wonder with Paul Simon. I can't wait for you to hear this episode. Give Malcolm a shout out on the internet, and yours truly will attempt to answer any questions you have, but I know you're going to love the show, so I'm going to get out of the way. Yours truly and Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, uh, you've done it again, sir. We're. Um, I just shared with you before we started recording that for the last several days, I it's been I'm operating out of Seattle, and it's been the typical Seattle fall, winter, lots of rain, and I spent the last few days uh, curled up on the couch, uh, rereading a bunch of your material, but mostly listening to uh, Miracle and Wonder, an incredible collaboration that you've just put out with uh, yourself and one of the greatest songwriters in modern history, uh, Mr. Paul Simon. So uh, that is one of the things I want to focus on. But before we do, for the handful Mm -hmm. of listeners who've been living under a rock and might not be familiar with you or your work, can you take us way back? uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself, mostly interested in your your earliest times and what sort of uh what made you you oh dear that's like yeah a, <laughs> let's go way back for the people who might not the, be familiar with your work that's quite the uh quite quite, quite the question um <laughs> well i'm a uh you know i'm a i'm a canadian i suppose i should start with that it seems very rel- very relevant um and i uh i came to this country after graduating from college on a kind of whim. I was actually an illegal immigrant for a while um, and stuck around, worked for the Washington Post for, then I worked at the New Yorker, sort of got interested in journalism and then started doing a podcast a couple of years ago called Revisionist History, wrote books on the side through much of the last 20 years. And now I'm at this audio company called Pushkin, um, which I started with my best friend, Jacob. And uh, we just make audio stuff, um, podcasts, audiobooks, anything that's got a sound component. Um, and that's been, that's the latest iteration on what has been a very unexpected ride. Didn't think I was going to, this is what I was going to end up doing in my life, but that's where it's been. I'm curious why. Uh... The Canadian part, obviously, you opened with your heritage. Um, you, there seemed to be something in your answer that anchored that um, being especially prescient right now. Like, what is it about your? Well, you your, said uh, you're in Seattle. Yes. And I always have a running thing. I call it South from, Canada, just for what it's worth. South Canada, yes. I was going to say, <laughs> every time I meet someone with Seattle, I was like, dude, why don't you just live in Vancouver? I mean, 
it's you know it's the same weather and it's only what is it two hours away Maybe, but it's like yeah. in every other way it's better i mean you, you know like <laughs> I, there's just no there's just no excuse for putting up with america when you could have canada canada's like right across the border so i thought i would throw that in there just to i'm actually even closer right now i'm operating from uh, we have a little beach house that's an hour and a half north of seattle so Borders like thirty minutes away, maximum. I could and, send, I could send one of those military head helicopters, pick up <laughs> your house, <laughs> fly it over the border, just dump it down on an equivalent beach and make on the on the on the Canadian side. Ah, <laughs> uh, I, I, well, there's plenty of reasons that that might I might take you up on that. Um, is can you describe a little bit of your upbringing? Uh, you know, yeah, obviously from... you're you're known for your writing, and you you articulated the different places that you'd spent time as a staff writer, and you mentioned books, and now you're obviously focused a lot on audio. But what you know, let's go back to childhood, because most of the people who are listening today are creators, entrepreneurs, uh, folks who um, would aspire to a path where it seems like what you've created for yourself is the ability to make a living and a life doing what you love. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, if there are things, uh, you know, maybe take a page out of outliers, like go, go back to, you know, wh how you were raised, what you were, what you believed in. And, um, is there any insights for us to, to gain from that? Yeah. Well, I, um, I grew up in a little tiny farming town in, um, Southwestern Ontario. Um, so, an hour and change west of Toronto, um, Canadian Bible, Ontario Bible Belt is basically where I grew up. Um, everyone I went to school with was pretty much either the uh, child or the grandchild of a farmer. Um, and uh, my dad was a professor, a math professor at a u nearby university um, and at the kind of Canadian science school. And my mom was a writer and a therapist. And so I grew up with parents who were very kind of independent minded and who neither of them had conventional. My dad used to always say that he'd never worked for anyone a day in his life, which I thought was a, a lovely way of describing what he did. Um, you know, they made their own way in the world, which was a really wonderful um, model for me as a kid. Uh, they didn't. They weren't institutional people. They were, um, they were people who think thought that you should do stuff that you thought was interesting. They weren't terribly hung up on how much money they were making. They were more interested in whether they were inspired by what they were doing. Um, they were deeply religious, which gave them a kind of um, strength and stability that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, yeah, it was a kind of. Um, so I I never thought that I never thought the path I chose was in any way a rebellion or a departure from the path of my parents. I mean, I sort of feel I'm just doing a version of what they did, maybe in a different place and with different kind of public consequences. But um, you know, a, a professor, my dad would get up every morning and sit at his desk and do math. It's not that different from what I, I get up every morning. He was telling stories in numbers, and I'm telling stories in words. So it's you know it's you can see the link in 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 um, between those two. I think those two activities. What about what about outside influences beyond family, beyond household? Um, well, especially I in that of, early the formative yeah, time for you. I had a friend. I had a number of friends who you know. Actually, the book we're going to be talking about, the Paul Simon book, was done with my friend Bruce, who I met on the first day of first grade in Canada um, in 1969. Um, and he was, his family was a lot more kind of culturally um, with it than mine. And he introduced me to a whole, a lot of what I know about music, I know through Bruce. My family was not terribly interested in popular music. Um, but I had another friend who had had an even bigger impact on me. Um, it's my, I, 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 by just total chance, a kid, there's a guy named Terry, who came from the family of, who had a chicken feed business. And Terry, neither of Terry's parents went to college. 
um, or even I think finished high school. I think they later finished high school. But he was from this extraordinary family, each one of whom did something more um, incredible than the last. Terry was and remains just about the smartest person I ever met. I met him in 10th grade biology class. And he was, all he wanted to do, he never wanted to do the experiment the way the experiment was supposed to be done, which in the beginning struck me as being really disruptive and problematic. And then I quickly realized was the right attitude to have. And he taught, Terry taught me that you should have the confidence to, to construct your intellectual life the way you wanted to construct it. And he went on to be, he's now a very distinguished professor at Harvard University. This kid from, his dad was running a chicken feed business. Um, <laughs> it's a really brilliant guy. But I happened, that was, I happened to run into these two extraordinary people. Bruce went on to be a editor of the New York Times. So from yeah. my little town in Canada, my little farming town in Canada, I had these two friends who I just happened to stumble into this incredibly sophisticated kind of peer network from the very beginning. Well, I did find it fascinating. I think it was in the, um, maybe in the the prologue to the audio book, you talked about, oh yeah, and I so I called my friend who knows a lot about music, and we've been friends since we were seven. <laughs> which six. Is, six. Six, six, yeah. yeah. It's like... That's that's quite quite the friendship, and it was an interesting twist to uh, introduce um, another character in the audio book. But you know, speaking of characters, the fact that that um, Bruce, uh, yeah, and and you just you have a little harem of friends from your town. That do you feel like there was something that the three of you? Um, reinforced in one another because I, I think it's fair to say that if I surveyed, you know, I've having I've had hundreds of guests on the show, and then mm -hmm. uh, in parallel, having talked to thousands of fans and and readers and listeners and watchers, people who are inspired by the guests, and there seems to be a divide between the people who pursued the things that they wanted to pursue by hook or crook for whatever, you know, by, by whatever reason they managed to make their way in the world. And so many folks who have listened have told me that that is one of the things that they love is that they're sort of by osmosis understanding what it takes to overcome what is sort of professed to me. And I think is true in popular culture, this hurdle of actually doing the thing versus doing the practical or the, the, yeah. the the easy or the available or the ready or the, the within arm's reach. And I think it's fascinating that all, you know, the group of you who have been friends for, I mean, what are you, 29 years old? So you get been friends for 22 years. Um, <laughs> Very I'll, let, I'll let that pass. <laughs> okay. Um, this is not journalism, by the way. <laughs> uh, just that you've been close for a long time. Is there, I'm trying to help provide some ingredients for those people at whatever stage they are, whatever station in life, mm -hmm. that the ability to grab the thing and pursue the thing that you want to do more than anything else in this world is available to you, despite yeah. differences in privilege and, you know, geography, orientation, all the different permutations that humans take. Well, it's funny. I have a couple of answers to that question. It's a really good one. One is to make reference to that you know, there's something in Paul Simon's story that really resonated with me, which is, you know, he's someone over the course, and I'll come back to me in a second, but he's someone over the course of his career who has felt that he had the right and freedom as a musician to engage with any, with whatever cultural tradition he wanted. That a, to him, the definition of being a musician is you get to play music with anyone who takes music seriously. Music is a common language. So he goes to South Africa to, to, put, to, to make Kreisland because to his mind, there, it's, not, it's not another culture or a foreign, unknown, scary group of people. It's musicians. They're, they're just like him. Or, you know, he'll go 
Then he went to Brazil, or early in his career, he made he would. There's a I talk in the book a lot about. There's a time when he went to Muscle Shoals, the famous recording studio, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and brings a. He's doing a you know a calypso themed song with a marching band from New Orleans, and he imports a gospel singer from New York, and he's in at the greatest R and B studio in Alabama, and like you would an outsider would look at that and say, oh my god, like six different cultural traditions, you know, colliding in one place. And he would say, no, we're all musicians. It's one one world. And why do I bring it up? Because the dominant metaphor of my life, when I say metaphor, maybe not even metaphor, real thing of my upbringing was libraries. My mom would take me to the local. We didn't have enough money for me to have a lot of my own books. So everything I read from at a very early age until I went to college came from a library. And my mom would take me to the library in town. And the library was this incredible thing because it's the same idea that every book in that library belongs to you, right? You can take out, there's no limit on what you can take out. Like mm -hmm. there's thousands and thousands of books and you can take out any one of them you want. You have an equal right to every bit of learning in that building, which is, an as a kid, I was like, that's amazing. Why mm -hmm. would I... Why would I buy a book? I knew I had friends who would read books that were on the shelves in their home. And I was like, are you nuts? Why would you limit yourself to the, you know, the 15 books your parents ha happened to have bought for you when you could go to, into town and there's a, there's 10,000 books you could choose from. And then my dad would take me to the library at the university when I was very young. I would, I would, he would just pull me out of school and I would go with him into into his work in the morning and I he would just plunk me in the library and lead me there. And now we have not 10,000, not, you know, not 2,000 volumes, but I don't know, 100,000 or whatever it was, a massive library. And that was even more of a, but it's the same idea that is in Paul Simon's work, which is the world of books or ideas in books belongs to anyone who wants to read the book, right? You're not limited at all in any way. And I, that was just the primary lesson of my childhood and that you, you you get to pick what book you read right which means you get to pick what you think about what you learn about you and i i actually by the time i got to college i had lost interest entirely in learning i never went to um lectures ever i just had no interest in why would i go somewhere and have someone else give me their version I can go to the library and I can read 10 different versions of that history. Isn't that better? That's what I did. I was a very, very serious student, but I just didn't think that a, sitting and listening to someone tell me what they thought of something was a useful way to spend my time um, when I could go to the library and get everything. Um, so anyway, Paul's like that. Like, sort of the great things about Paul Simon is like, he's not a folk singer who thinks he can only work within that narrow tradition or a pop singer who thinks he can only do or you know he could talk as enthusiastically about doo-wop from the 50s as he does about brazilian rhythms that he discovered in his 50s or is that about what drew you Baroque? to that project is that, that is there a similarity between your that this is it's interesting to me you're coming from Paul's life to explain yours I'm trying to go from your life to explain Paul's and yeah. this overlap in in the project because I found from what I know about you and have read and and just the library I think there's a, an analogy or a metaphor baked into there it is actually your life but there's a bigger bigger I think um inference to to draw there but is is that what drew you to Paul's project? That I mean, you've written yes. across a vast number of subjects, and yeah. in fact, I I loved that that bit in in the book in in Miracle and Wonder, where people have tried to pin folk singer on Paul. I think it was in the chapter called something about the Queen's chapter. If they Queen, try and yes. pin, yeah, they've tried to pin folk singer and he's like no that was i was an imposter i was from queens how could queens you have to be from minneapolis like dylan or you yeah. know uh some you know some far away place in the sticks to be able to talk about that and i'm i'm from up the street i think he talks about it being i'm a 10 minute train ride from where we're playing tonight and that sort of made him 
an outsider, but yet he was comfortable participating in any one of those through the common language of music, as you mentioned. And is that why you have chosen this? Because you're, is there a parallel between you've written, you know, about high performers and about um, pop culture tipping points and about, you know, that I couldn't help but think that there is this amazing some, Venn diagram of your well, life. There, there is, in a number of, I think you're right. I would say what interests me the most about him, and it's not necessarily because I see a commonality with him, but I was drawn to him because of his longevity, mm. because it's so insanely rare in his world to be someone who's musically relevant over the span of 50 years. So he's relevant in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and aughts, and still making music now, but I mean, he's a central part of the conversation for 50 years. Um, and you know, there is almost no other example of that. Um, and that's what drew me because that's something I, I would, you know, in my wildest dreams, I would love to be relevant for that long too. And so the question of how you stay relevant in that way fascinates me. Um, but also the, I've always, his, his continual desire to reinvent himself is something that I was drawn to because I don't think I'm, I'm not nearly as successful at it as he is, but I have very consciously tried to reinvent myself. I started out as a newspaper writer. Then I decided, you know what? I should be a magazine writer. And then I was like, you know what? I should write books. And then I was like, you know what? I should be, I should have a podcast. And then I was like, you know what? I should help start a company. Those were all conscious steps that I didn't I think it was healthy to do the same thing um, over and over again. You know, never mind. I don't know if you're a sports fan, but yes, when Tiger Woods was at his peak, he would periodically reinvent his swing, and there'd always be a transition period of six months, where or whatever it was, where he would look awful and he would lose tournaments, and all kinds of people would say, "You're the greatest golfer of all time. Why are you monkeying?" with your swing, right? Why do you go through this painful process of like, and you look awful right now, blah, blah, blah. And I remember how much abuse he would get for that. And I, I would, it's funny, I never, I always saw the logic of what he was doing. To my mind, it made perfect sense. Of course you would reinvent your swing. You invent your swing because you're the best. If you, if you only reinvent your swing when you're terrible, when everything has fallen apart, then you're acting out of desperation. He's He was reinventing his swing because from a position of strength, he was like, I am the greatest golfer in the world. I'm interested in being the greatest golfer in the world for a long time. And I understand that the only way I'm gonna do that is if I come up with new versions of Tiger Woods for each new challenge. And the Tiger Woods who cleaned up at 21 cannot buy by definition, be the Tiger Woods who cleans up at 31, right? I gotta be a different Tiger Woods. I'm gonna, and like, that made so much sense to me. Like, yes, of course, try your, and who cares if you're, if you have six months of transition, you've won God knows yeah. how many majors, right? Right, and six so, years of flourish for six months of transition. Who yeah. cares, right? So Paul Simon is that, you know, he, it would have been at any point of his career after Simon and Garfunkel, he could have stopped writing music and just played his yep. old hits and made a kajillion dollars, mm -hmm. right? Just tour, you could tour forever these days if you're that big at some point. Tons of people do that. And what does he do? He continually reinvents himself at great personal cost, by the way. He makes a movie, the movie doesn't do well. He does a pours his life into a Broadway play and is devastated by the reception, even though it's a great play, right? I'm using, you know, um, he, so he's like that, that aspect of his life really did speak to me because that struck me as being um, something that's crucial to, uh, to, 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 to how you continue to flourish as a, as a, as a, as a creative. Yeah, I think on the show we talk a lot about there's creativity with the, you know, with the small C, the arts, writing, 
you know, uh, podcasting, filmmaking, photography, design, and then there's creativity with the capital C, which is just creativity with the small C at a different scale you mm-hmm. know, and pointed toward different endeavors and including the creating of one's life. That's the major theme of this show, creativity with the capital C applied. And I personally was fascinated by a, that same thread in Paul's life. Um, I opened our conversation with this sort of nostalgic last few days, um, listening to, again, and we're obviously talking very overtly now about your latest project, which is called Miracle and Wonder, the audio biography of Paul Simon, um, which was recorded, as I understand it, over, I think, nine something, four plus hour conversations. 40 uh, hours of tape. Yes. 40 hours of tape, which I'm telling you, it's just, it's so cool because there's enough, you've, you've created enough material that you can really explore some of these tangents and the, I love the trifecta you and, and, and Bruce and, uh, and Paul, the different locations. It's, it's just fascinating. I I really, I, I highly recommend it for anyone who's, who's listening, but it, to me, what was, um, the thread of invention and reinvention. And then when I obviously let's just go tipping point in 2000 blink in 2005 outliers in 2008, uh, what the dog saw 2009, David Goliath, 2013, talking to strangers, 2019 bomber mafia there. I mean, these are, you're not really slowing down. It seems like if you're looking at the gap between books, if anything, you're accelerating you Malcolm as an artist. Mm -hmm. I found that to be fascinating about Paul's world, his, you know, he had success. I think I remember a point in the book where he talks about their first hit was when they were in high school. Yeah. He has a, he's got a crazy, it's a big hit a hundred thousand. Yeah. When they were on American bandstand, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So, and then you think of the career accelerating and is there some, what I'm getting at is this concept of mastery. Mm -hmm. And when you, why I advocate anyone pursuing anything to, to master something, because then you have an awareness of what mastery feels like, and you're more able to then apply the same principles of mastery in one discipline. There's an analog in, in lots of other areas. Do you feel like mastery has been important to you was it important to paul or and is it important in general in again speaking to our audience of listeners here to pursue the things that interest you you talked about you know you sampled many things you did a lot you read whatever book you wanted in the library how important is going deep on one thing relative to your life or career arc yeah well he's um so one of the things that's fascinating about paul is that He comes, you know, his father was a professional musician. So he's raised in a household where music is a craft, a craft and a profession. Um, And he begins, I think, his understanding of music through that lens. It was something that you studied and you learned and you mastered that allowed you to do much more creative work on top of that kind of... um, uh, proficiency. And there's nothing, you know, there's some people when you talk to them about creative work and they use all kinds of kind of, of, um, of, uh, flowery and, um, ethereal language. There's nothing in that with Paul. I mean, you really feel like there's a process and it's all very concrete, which is not to say that he doesn't appreciate the magic of creativity, but the point is that his, he approaches it with a seriousness of purpose, the way a professional does. And his respect for other musicians is based on, he, when he sees someone who shares his seriousness of purpose, they win his respect. And that all the collaborations that he's done over the course of his life were with other musicians who had that kind of, that, you know, the mm-hmm. people he put together for Graceland he goes to South Africa and he basically auditions the leading musicians of South Africa and says, okay, you, you're who I want. You're who you, you don't work. You, you know, he, and because he's looking for that same kind of, um, uh, 
gravitas, right? That's, and I keep saying serious is a purpose. It really is, he's not messing around, right? He's not, you know- You get that like, sense from the yeah, book, for it's, sure. It's, this, is his, this is his career and he's attending to it and, he's, and he has enormous respect for the complexity of the job that he's taken. I have a similar, I also responded to that because, you know, writing to my mind, if you sit around waiting for inspiration, you will wait for your entire life. It's not what you do. You, you, you go and you have to put in the work. You have to master all aspects of storytelling. You have to be, one of my favorite things I used to do, I haven't done this in years, is I, whenever I found a, read something I really loved, I would ask the person who wrote it, how many drafts did you do? Because what you would discover is the stuff that you like the most, that you think is of the highest quality has the most drafts. So when the person who wrote it says, oh, I did 15 drafts, then you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. And by the way, they're not shy about admitting that because some people would say, oh, if I did 15 drafts, it makes it sound like I'm you know, they, they think it's much more romantic and um, self-congratulatory to say, yeah, I mean, I just, one drive, it just poured out of me. Just it was perfect. Went over a weekend. Yeah. Right? No serious writer no. ever says that. They say the opposite. They understand that when you say you did 30 drafts, what you are telling the person you're talking to is that you're a serious writer. Take mm -hmm. this seriously. And you understand how hard writing is, right? So that like... I do, I'm in the middle of writing a new thing now, and I do new drafts, even when I'm not sure there's anything wrong with the draft. You have to do a draft. You have to, you gotta go back and rewrite it, even if you think there's something wrong with it. There is something wrong with it, you just haven't seen it yet. So you have to like commit to taking the time. You sit with it and read it and think about it, and you will figure out what's wrong with it, right? If you go by your intuition that, oh, it seems right to me, no. It's, you know, you, that's not the way it works. It's like, there. trust me, there's something wrong with it, right? Because writing is hard. And I think that's true of any high achiever in any field I've ever talked to shares that attitude. They, they, there is a kind of relentless perfectionism below the surface that forces them to go back over and over and over what they're doing until they get it right. Is that contribute? Uh, let's go to your your uh, audiobook about Paul. Is mm -hmm. that tenacity the thing that is that the sole thing that has kept him relevant? As you said, for more than fifty years, is there some? Is it is it a is it a science an art alchemy like? What are the ingredients that have gone into his relevance, given that that was one of the things that originally attracted you to him? Yeah. Clearly, you've, you've peeled the onion. You spent 40 hours talking to the man. What, what are the ingredients that you think has gone into this? Is it an insatiability for relevance, or is it just a focus on the craft? And like, what, what's, the, what's the alchemy of It's some combination. Ingredients? I did a whole chapter of the book um uh about memory because i thought memory i wonder i've come to believe that memory is a kind of under theor plays an under theorized underappreciated role in creativity um hmm. i was struck by this fact um, just so people know you know the way the book works is we sat down with him had conversations with him took those conversations edited them and then added commentary so it's this combination of us, Bruce and I talking with, Bruce and me talking with Paul, um, uh, and, or Bruce and I talking with Paul, and then sort of analysis, arguments, you know, there are moments where I kind of try and interpret what we're listening to. So it's this sort of, it's an unusual kind of book. It's this, um, but, uh, one of the things that struck me from the beginning was he has this uncanny memory for sound. Mm -hmm. So he can, here he is at 78, he can recreate for you the experience he had listening to a piece of music when he was 12. And he can tell you about that song, even if he hasn't listened to that song in 70 years, 
he can say, okay, there's a point in that song where this happens. And then we play it and sure enough, exactly what he remembered was true. And I was reminded of, I've come to believe this is a common occurrence in very creative people. I did a, you know, the director, Ron Howard, who's very similar to Paul Simon in many ways, in that he's maintained, he has been relevant in popular film for all, almost, not quite as, for almost as long as Paul has been relevant in popular music. That, you know, directors do not have long shelf lives. They they have a moment and then they're, they're often they're making projects that no one lives. Ron Howard's making commercially, you know, for 30 years now it's been going on. And I say, he had a book came out and I interviewed him and his brother about this book that they just wrote. And what I discovered was that they had the same thing, particularly Ron. Ron has, a, but it's not for sound or music. It's a memory for character and conversation that he can recreate his childhood in a way that astonished me. I, I don't remember anything in my childhood. He remembers everything. He wrote a book that is full of, this book that he wrote with his uh, brother it's a recreation of their childhood. And it's as if these are two guys in their 60s and they're writing about it like it happened yesterday. And then I was reminded, and we use this a little bit in the book, we quote this little bit from LeBron James being interviewed after a game and someone, someone brings up some moment in the basketball game and LeBron recreates not just that moment, but everything around it. Just off the top of his head, he says, okay. And then he just, he does like five minutes on absolutely everything that happened on the court in that little two minute window of a game that just happened. Like, and you realize there's a reason why all those three people are at the top of their game. And it has in part, part, only in part, to do with their memory. That when you have that kind of precise memory, then you have a kind of archive in your head that you can draw from. You know, in LeBron's case, it's almost easiest to describe there because in, the same thing was true, by the way, of Larry Bird. All these great players can do this. And what it means is it's like a chess player can look at a board and they can, they can summon that exact position from memory, from some other game, and remember, well, what happened next in that previous game, right? There's a name that's called chunking. Is the so LeBron could be in a situation in a basketball where everyone on the court is in a certain position. And because he has perfect memory, he can say, okay, I've been in this exact position on a basketball court 12 times. 10 of those instances I did, you know, I did 10 different things over those 12 instances. Nine of those 10 things didn't work, but one of them worked brilliantly. Okay, I'm going to do the one that worked brilliantly, right? So he's got this kind of encyclopedic, I think a great Great entrepreneurs do this mm -hmm. without realizing they're doing it. Yep. That mental maps and models. They have yeah. these models they've built up over time that are incredibly specific and incredibly useful. Okay, this is this is what I'm what I'm in right now looks really scary and new, but in fact, I've been here before. I've been in an analogous situation. And here's what I did, or here's what someone I was observing did. And that gives me a guide to how to decipher my current situation. Well, Simon's doing that with sound. I'm in the studio. I have a challenge. How do I bring certain this certain moment of this particular music to life? Well, I, I go to my memory, and I have a hundred analogous moments to draw on. And I can take those hundred bits and recreate them and make something totally new out of my memories. Now, if you don't have that memory, if you only have 10 things in memory, you are you can't do it. You're not a genius. You're making, you're making something familiar and derivative. And, but if you have 10 times the, me the musical memories in your head, then you could do something that sounds wholly new. Is that something that we can cultivate? Or is that a natural gift? I think it... I think it's a combination. I think the reason these people I've all described have this precise memory is that they value their experiences. So on some level, when they go through an experience, as opposed to dismissing it, they're storing it. So they're mindful of their... So when Paul listens to a song, he doesn't listen to a song the way we listen to a song. We listen to a song and say, oh, that's great. 
Let me go on with our life. He listens to a song and says, okay, what did I just hear? And I think the, you know, the entrepreneur who has an experience, they have the same thing. They're like, well, what did what just happened? And they 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 go through the experience and break it down and store it deliberately in their kind of memory banks. That's the difference. They understand mm -hmm. they're not playing around and they're not trivializing their experiences. They're understanding their experiences are the source of their creativity. If you, I'm going to try and extend this concept a little bit. So I have found, I have learned from so many different people, different types of people, any and number of lessons, right? You can learn from anything, anybody. And if there is, you know, Paul has this genius in music, you have it in writing. Um, is it a matter then for those listeners who want to tap into this very important part of themselves? Mm -hmm. Is it more than about understanding your genius and discovering your genius? Or is it just some people are better at X and should, should do Y for a profession? And this, I'm trying to find this interrelationship between you being willing and able to read any book, whatever interests you and mm -hmm. the path that most people choose. Again, what we're talking about is greatness. LeBron James, Malcolm Gladwell, Paul you're, Simon. You're, there you're, is, you're giving me the, the, the I, I'm the, very happy to do that. You're on my show now. You, you unwarranted. We're really <laughs> trying, I'm, I'm really trying to solve problems for the listeners right now. They yeah. are going to go and they're going to listen to, to the book. They're going to, they're going to buy miracle and wonder, and they are going to get to taste this. I am yeah. trying to incent them. If anyone's yeah. on the, yeah. on, on, the the cusp of like I'm, i don't know what i found so freaking compelling about that book about the other works that you have created is there is a certain genius and when you hear genius when you're close to genius you hear what it sounds like i believe that that's in everyone in some capacity and what where we stumble is in the discovery phase you are willing to read every book yeah. Most people are shown a book in their household, a shelf, and like choose from these five books. So yeah. help us connect the dots between think, the, the work that you've done with Paul yeah. Simon in, in recording this, Miracle and Wonder, and the relevance to the audience. Like what you're I, hearing is genius on display. And yeah. is, that, is that another thing that attracted it to you? And is that possible for others to tap into? I mean, I do think there is, I mean, is it possible? To and be... don't sugarcoat it, by the way. Sorry to interrupt, but like, if you don't believe it's true, I don't like. I'm not asking you to, yeah, assuage my question. No, I, I mean, is it possible for an ordinary musician to be Paul Simon? No, I mean, he is a once in a million, but that doesn't mean it's not useful. Or you can't greatly improve your performance by studying people like that. Um, so to talk about this memory thing for a moment. What is what is at the root of that with someone like him or LeBron or Ron Howard or whatever? Um, it is their willingness to be introspective about their own experiences to start. So it's this understanding that in order to move forward and do something new, I have to understand what I've already done. So you can't, there, I'm, this is, I mean, and this is a fascinating point that I used to think that the really creative person is someone who was relentlessly focused on what was ahead on the next thing. That is true, but it misses this crucial element, which is in order to be sophisticated and smart and open to new experiences, you have to really understand where you've been and you've got to understand what you have learned. And the only way to for example, the only way to learn from a mistake is to dwell on the mistake, <laughs> really dwell on the mistake. All right, so what, like, and be willing to, To it's painful, and but it's necessary. You, you have to actually think about, okay, well, why did that go wrong? Um, what does that tell me about 
myself and the way I approach a problem. And, you know, it's that kind of, and so what we're, what we were revealing in Miracle and Wonder with Paul Simon is we, we caught someone at, in, in middle age who has done a lifetime of this kind of reflection, mm. right? It's been a, he's been reflecting on his career from the beginning of his career, right? Because he understood how central that kind of reflection was to evolving as an artist. So now he's got 70 years of reflections. And we were just on, we were just like running the tape recorder as it came out. But he's as thoughtful about a record he would have made in 1964 as is about the music he's writing now. You know, there's no difference in his mind. If yeah. if he's if he has done it, it's worth him thinking about it and trying to learn from it. You know, um, you know, he he was hilarious. On he doesn't like the song "Sound of Silence," which is everyone always considers that to be one of his classic songs. Yeah, he doesn't he's just he does not like it. He just thinks it's juvenile. But like, it still he still thinks about it. You know, it's like it's been he wrote that in when did he write that? 1963 or something. It's now 2021. It's still he's still willing to go back there and say, Okay, well, why does that song not work for me? Right? That's a question. He that's a conversation he will have with himself. Um, and that's like, that's to me the that's the crucial lesson here yeah. is maybe we need to spend more time on this kind of, of self-reflection um, on in our chosen um, uh, field. Well, know thyself, right? That's the, uh, yeah. <laughs> it goes, I think it goes pretty far back in history. Uh, I think it's pretty relevant. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you experientially, mm -hmm. What was it like? I know you recorded in a, a number of different locations. I think not all nine recordings were in different locations, but everything from like in, I think Paul's backyard was one. You can hear the pit bull barking in the background. You know, there's all these different. Hawaii. Um, we were in this hilarious little <laughs> basement studio in Hawaii where its only claim to fame was that Mick Fleetwood had recorded something there <laughs> yeah, once. I found that fascinating <laughs> the way. Yeah. And, but, it, it, um, how did the various locations manifest themselves in the material that you were able to grasp? And was that something that you would do again or would you change and, or constrain that? Or was it the unconstrained, she's Paul, we'll record anywhere we can get you for five hours. We'll come to you. Like, yeah. You know, just I was fascinated by what yeah. role that may have played in the creative process. Well, his studio, his studio in his backyard, and that one's he's used for years and is full of a lot of his pictures and instruments. And so he would often at the beginning of our conversations just walk around the room and pick up things, and that would trigger memories and things. So that was when very distinct experience. And then when he was, when we were in Hawaii and we were just in this random studio up in the hills, he had none of those kind of props. And which is not a better or worse, it's just different. So mm -hmm. there he was almost forced out of his comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I found that some of the most emotional, emotional stuff we got was from the Hawaii sessions when he's he's just alone and he was it was an hour from his house um or more than an hour and he would drive himself in his new he had a he, a new tesla he was very very happy with and he was driving which first of all what rock star drives himself an hour to meet in the studio in the middle of nowhere like i was like paul did, did you miss rock star training school like anyway he would show up and i think he was so he'd show up in this strange place he'd never been to before after an hour driving. And it just made him more kind of reflective. And mm. so I think you're right. I mean, if I was doing it again, I mean, you can't do this for logistical reasons, but I would love to do one of these where it was 10 different sessions in 10 different places. Because I do think it does make a difference. Um, it, as the listener, I, 
I was fascinated. I could feel the di different energy. And of course, you're, mm -hmm. you're crafting the narrative with the sound bites and the editing, but there was definitely very distinct emotional arcs uh, from the different locations. The first one you guys meet, he's wearing a, you know, a sweatshirt and a Yankees baseball hat. And then you go to, you know, Hawaii and then you're in his backyard and the, you know, the pit bull is barking in the background and like, it just, it, I know obviously you're a master storyteller, but it just created, um, this really interesting emotional resonance with me. And where I'm going with this line of questioning is now t to audio specifically, mm -hmm. you have shifted, as you mentioned earlier, this concept of invention and reinvention It's popular on the show. I'm interested in it personally talked about uh, being a newspaper writer, then a magazine writer, then a book writer, then a podcaster, and now an audio book creator in this new, what is a fascinating, um, I don't know if I would call it genre, but with, with Pushkin now, you're the president of Pushkin. Mm -hmm. um, what is, are, are we perhaps, or are you trying to, in your own way, create a, is it a tipping point to reference your own book? with audio because I was just, it felt like, you know, again, sitting, I was sitting largely in a dark room with the fire, just listening to this amazing mm -hmm. story unfold. Is yeah. that part of, is that what, are you trying to do that? Or is this just an exploration yeah, of another we are. medium? Okay. We're trying to push. We think there's so much kind of room for reinvention and creativity in audio. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm doing a book right now, um, and a new a new audio book. It'll be both a print book and an audio book, but I'm sort of thinking about the audio book first. Mm. And uh, without going into the details of what the book's about, there's a moment in the book where several of the key characters in the book are all gathered at a church in South Central and in Los Angeles. And we got tape. So if you're writing the book for print, you just, the place where they are is not, is important, you'll describe it, but you're interested in what is said. If you have the audio, then all of a sudden, your entire understanding of that scene changes. Because I, I looked and hunted and finally got tape of that, evening it's in the evening and one of the tapes and you're listening to somebody speak and of course it's a black church so there's there's a kind of vibe right and as the person's talking the organist of course as you do in those in that tradition the organist accompanies you as you talk right and when you pause and you learn the rhythms exactly <laughs> and all of a sudden, you, I was listening to this tape and I was like, oh God, this is amazing. This is amazing. And my understanding of, and I realized the audio experience of listening to this is totally different from the print experience of reading about it. Not better necessarily, but different. Mm -hmm. You can do something different. I can, I can communicate the emotionality of that moment in this whole different way. And when you hear the crowd going, uh-huh, and then the organ playing, and then the person responding to those rhythms, and you're getting into, and you're realizing that they're about to say something that's very, very emotional and, and painful and difficult. And it, man, that's different. That's just mm -hmm. like, you know, I've spent my life telling stories the print way, where what you were interested in is in communicating the ideas. And now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in a form that allows me to communicate the emotion. Mm. That's exciting. I've been a visual artist my whole life and I'm fascinated by audio because our eyeballs are now taken up with so many screens in the world. And there's this opportunity to, um, I guess, communicate in audio that allows people to move through the world. And, and it's sort of, there's less competition and there's more room for innovation. It feels like it feels rich, which is, I think just the, the essence behind my question. So doesn't come out of left field for you. I, just, I was just fascinated. Again, tipping point, you know, referring to your own work and audio, like of all of the things that you could pursue, 
presumably you could be doing films, you know, pals with Ron Howard. You could be making the next movie written, you know, based on one of your books or whatever, but you're choosing audio. I found that really interesting. Um, one of the last areas I'd like to press on a little bit, it's a little bit, mm-hmm. um, it's a little bit selfish, but I would say the, I think in chapter 10 of the book, about 10 minutes in, there's a phrase that echoes a phrase that's also very popular with our listenership and, and one that I've championed for a long time. And I'm, mm-hmm. I want to get your take on it. And it's this concept of different, not just better. Um, I'm wondering if you, A, recall the moment in the book, in chapter 10, about 10 minutes in, um, and chapter 10 is the chapter on uh, the cameo with Aaron Lindsay, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, And I'm wondering if I say that phrase, being different, not just better, what does that mean? And uh, just off the cuff, you know, how to, does it resonate with you? If so, how? Uh, is, if, if memory serves, is that in, is that a description of the Aretha Franklin version of Bridge Over Troubled Water? That it's, it's different, not just better than. Yeah. I just made a note here because that's a phrase that I'm constantly yeah. throwing out into the world. And it, it seemed, yeah, it's just this, the originality, the fingerprint of the individual being unique and taking these unique, the unique lens that we all have on the world. And, you know, our version of it is more important than a better version Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of something. And, you know, that's sort of the, the, I like that idea a lot that it, particularly with art, that what is crucial is your relationship to the work and not just the work's kind of objective value, mm-hmm. um, which is not to say the objective value is not important. It is crucially important, but there has to be truly powerful art is work that connects on both those levels that has some, that reaches some standard of understood, of, of, of understandable excellence. Mm-hmm. And at the same time touches your heart in this very specific way. You know, I'm reminded in, and that those two components in combination are what create something that's memorable for a, you know, we would have these discussions periodically with Paul in the book about, you know, what were his favorite songs and what were our favorite songs. And what's striking, of course, is that, you know, you don't, everyone has a different list of favorite mm-hmm. Paul Simon songs to our point that, and it's not that no one would claim, I'm not going to claim that my list of what my favorite Paul Simon songs uh, is, is a better list than yours. It's diff- It's a different list than yours. Mm-hmm. These are the ones that speak to me. And part of the reason I would have great pleasure in sharing that list with you is that I'm genuinely curious to find out how your list differs from mine, not, not resembles mine. There are yeah, cases the same. Yeah. yeah, where we do, we do look for concordance in our lists where it's really important to know, you know, if I'm asking you what the best baby seat is, I don't want some, but the baby seat you have an emotional reaction to. I want an ob- objectively, I want to know which baby seat is the, you know, easiest to install, the safest, safest the, yeah, right? Yeah. I got, you know, but art's different. Yeah. Art's not that. And it, in the beauty of it is, I, in that case, in, in when it comes to art, I genuinely want to know why your list is different than mine. And why you, why, and, and the reasons for it. Why did that song touch you? You know, and, and I'd love to explain to you why this other song touched me in a way that, you know, that's, where the conversation starts to get really wonderful. Speaking of wonderful conversation, this has been an amazing conversation. Grateful for your time. Congratulations on another work of genius, uh, Miracle and Wonder, you and Bruce and the legendary Paul Simon. It was, uh, I don't say this often, it was one of the things that I didn't want to end. 
I just oh. I listened to a couple yeah. things a number of times, and uh, thanks for setting me up with an advanced copy. It was a, it was an absolute treat. I absolutely recommend it to everybody, and uh, I know it's going to be successful. And congratulations on your this journey that you're on with audio. It's really fascinating to watching you explore a new uh, a new medium and or I guess re-emerging medium. Uh, and I know this is going to be super successful. I really appreciate you for your time signing off. Is there anything that you want to uh, champion in this particular work of yours that that we out there in the world aren't championing mm -hmm. for you? Is there something that's slipping through the cracks as you're giving no, interviews always, and talking about the work? All, all good. All good. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I just I mean, I I hear the enthusiasm in your voice and that's enough for me. Awesome. Well, signing off from South Canada, um, I really enjoyed our conversation, Malcolm. Thanks you again. Too. Congratulations on the work. I know it's going to be a big success. Yeah. And until next time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Chase. Yeah.